much indeed for coming. My name is Alan Germain. If I haven't met you already, I apologize for my waywardness. Uh, I'm a co-facilitator of Southern Oregon Climate Action now, and this, as you under, and undoubtedly are aware, is the special topic. We have one of these every month before our general meeting, and of course we encourage you to join us in our general meeting, which starts at 6.30 in the big room. I will try and speak up. Thank you. And if I am not doing it, shout at me again, and Donnie, be alert. <laughs> Uh, it's a great thrill for me to introduce to you our guest speaker today. Um, we met Donnie several months ago and started talking to him and chatting with him about what he does. And immediately we decided we wanted to get him to come and do a program. It was long after that that I discovered, besides the topic that Donnie is going to share with you, he also is, and he is the first and potentially the last ever Guinness Book of Words World Records holder that we have had. <laughs> Donnie has the record, you still have it, right, for being the fastest on foot across Australia. <laughs> but what Donnie is going to talk about, as you have seen the title, is the not-for-profit not world beyond <clears throat> capitalism. Donnie is the executive director of the Post-Growth Institute at Southern Oregon University. And without more ado. Ooh. There is a way out of this mess, but it involves and needs your involvement moving forward. Because I imagine so many of you are already involved in so many wonderful activities, whether it's the local community garden, whether it's caregiving, whether it's education and helping people. And so many of you are passionate about the climate and ensuring that we live in a world that flourishes rather than perishes. But what's been needed for some time now, and what was needed on the back of the Occupy movement that saw thousands of groups assemble around the world calling for change, what's needed is an economics that aligns with our deepest held values. An economics of love, an economics of enough. The exciting thing is that we're on our way towards it. This journey for me began about six or seven years ago in Australia. I was at a conference and a gentleman got up and spoke about his engineering company. He called my Yuma, 50 staff, $16 million turnover. And this engineering company works with roads and civil construction. And I was thinking this is a pretty typical engineering company that has a little more social value than I would expect when this gentleman said the words that changed the course of my life and brings me here today to speak with you. He told me his engineering company was not for profit. Now that was pretty strange because I grew up in the 80s and not for profit for me or non-profit meant a certain thing. It meant charities, it meant organisations that were generally volunteer run, that worked in the social sectors. So to hear about an organisation or a company that was an engineering firm that was not for profit really changed the way I thought about things. And I found that in talking with people in this area in the Road Valley, it's a similar transition that once it happens, opens up a whole range of new possibilities in terms of this widening of understanding around non-profits or not-for-profits. So here one might think of non-profits or not-for-profit activities and think of Road Manor. Or you might think of Community Works. <coughs> or you might think <coughs> of the Maslow Project. But do you also think about the food co-op? Do you think about the Road Credit Union? Do you think about Asante Hospital? Do you think about the Brick Festival? Or if you go over to Ashland, are you thinking about the Shakespeare Festival? Or what about, and I'm not sure if the equivalent here exists in Medford, but the Ashland Fibre Network, where the city itself runs the internet. So it's a fascinating thing when you start to understand that not-for-profit doesn't just mean non-profit in terms of the kinds of organisations that we associate with the 501c3 status legally. In fact, not-for-profit encompasses a whole lot of different organisations that include various forms of consumer cooperative, 
credit unions, associations, organizations, and businesses that now cover all sorts of fields. The exciting thing that's happened over the last 20 years, almost unspoken around the world, is not only has not-for-profit expanded into new areas like the internet, such as Mozilla Firefox, the not-for-profit browser, but it's also shifted from within in terms of its own model. And what happened was that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, as neoliberalism rolled in around the world on the back of uh, certain policy prescriptions led by this country and others, what happened was that not-for-profit managers started to get sick of the boom and bust cycle of capitalism. They, they were, started to get really frustrated with the fact that if there was a crisis, the first funding to be pulled was from the non-profit sector. So what did they do? I imagine they did exactly what anyone would do in that circumstance. They worked out how could we be resilient in the face of these boom and bust cycles. And so they started to build in business models underneath their activities. Just like Goodwill Industries here in Medford does. They build a business model in which they engage in the marketplace by selling things. And the the profits from that go back into the organization and the work that it does, as well as employing people uh, that often have difficulties in terms of engaging with an inaccessible work market. The extent to which these organizations <coughs> built in business models is mind-blowing, because it, it's still hard for me to think of all the world's not-for-profit activities I think of business models. I still think of charities. But the reality is that business models have been built in to an incredible extent, such that across 26 different countries, including the US, when you look at all of not-for-profit activity across hospitals, education, IT, communications, tourism, all sorts of fields, 43% of revenue for those organizations is now earned income. It's self-generated. There's been a massive shift that's been happening that no one's talked about, where non-profits have become not-for-profit enterprises, developing their own business models and entering the market. Why does this matter? Well, because the story we've been told of what a marketplace should look like has been very narrow. The story we've been told is that if you want to set up a business, you set up a for-profit business. And if you're lucky enough, it'll expand, and you might have franchises, or if you're even luckier, you'll float it on the stock market. And you'll make a whole lot of money when that goes public. But we know, in terms of what we feel and what we see, that the rising debt that sits underneath so much of business around the world, and the impacts of an ever-growing population and an ever-growing pressure in terms of climate uh, change and the like, we know that this starts to put more and more pressure on for-profit businesses that have been cut <coughs> corners for so long. Profit margins have been falling across pretty much every sector for the last 40 years. And how has that been hidden to us? It's been hidden because behind the books, we don't see the debt. We didn't know that Enron was going to collapse necessarily. We didn't know that Kodak was going to go under, just like that. We don't know how many for-profit companies are out there at the moment, right on the edge, squeezing the last little bit out of gains in productivity and cuts in employment. What this precarious situation does is it sets up the dynamics for a quite rapid shift to a different economy. Because what are the constant proposals that are put forward for people that say that are our situation is, is leading us to two crises. We've got a crisis of inequality, where 75 people control as much as half of the world's wealth. And we have a climate crisis, where we're now living in overshoot, where our drawdown on the Earth's resources is more than the Earth is actually able to beautifully replenish. <coughs> we're drawing down on the Earth's capital at a rate that is too fast. And the latest research by Graham Turner and others at Melbourne University shows we are on track for collapse by 2050 at this rate. Just like the Limits of Growth report said with its middle track back in the 70s. 
So what's the common response to these things? Well, you have people on one hand say, free up the market, let the market really be free, and let for-profit businesses show that they can innovate our way out of this. But as Tim Jackson shows out of uh, the UK, that's just not possible. The speed with which we need to innovate in order to get ourselves out of the mess, just on the topic of decarbonisation, is 16 times faster than we've been able to innovate to date. That's totally infeasible, no matter how much energy and resources you put. Forgetting the challenges that are there politically to put resources in, into, into innovation. It's totally unfeasible to think that there is a techno fix out of this and that the market left alone to its devices will provide for an equitable world that can fit within limits. Why? Because free market economics, in a for-profit sense, doesn't have a mechanism for redistribution built into it. It doesn't deliver services to people in lower socioeconomic um, stratifications. Why? Because they can't pay. That's what the whole social welfare state was set up to counterbalance. So you then go to the other end of the spectrum and people who say we need to regulate the market more heavily. But you run into problems there as well. Not only politically in a country as divided as this in terms of regulation, look how difficult it has been post-2008 to actually get regulatory reform in relation to banking. Not only is it so difficult to do that, but there are some legitimate arguments for how a heavily regulating state actually does limit innovation. You only have to go as far as well in, in terms of a long extent in looking at the history of communism and what has happened when the state heavily regulates. The problem these days is that the state is so in bed with the for-profit sector that we fall into the same sorts of problems. A heavy regulating state just centralises power in a different way. And what I feel, and what I imagine you all feel, is the future is in decentralised power. It's in communities being in control. People who know best about how to look after their areas. And trying to work that in with an economics that actually fits globally so that in a globalised world we can all interrelate and trade can actually work within limits for all our good. So what then if we don't have a market alternative in a for-profit sense and we don't have an alternative in terms of a state-centred approach, what's the alternative? Well, you've got some other people saying that in the middle you've got hybrid organisations, B corporations, B corps, uh, various forms of social enterprise that offer a way forward. But generally these theories still include this notion of for-profit business, that people can have private equity within a company, that if you're lucky, you can be doing social good, and you can also make a lot of money. The problem with this is that you get the same stratification dynamics that sit underneath our inequitable situation, that are the conditions in which we have an unsustainability narrative that evolves. Let me explain that a little better. Any time you have the ability for people to privatise wealth through establishing and developing their own businesses <coughs> in a way that has no limit, essentially, you create the conditions for greater inequity. That's what Thomas Piketty's work has shown most recently when he hit the number one bestseller list with his book on economics in Amazon. He showed that if you've got money, you can make more money. And so throughout... <coughs> looking at a long period of capitalism over a few hundred years and many countries, the wealthy have the capacity to make more money than the people who aren't wealthy. It's a simple theory, really, and it makes sense. So if you have a system that's still enabling people to invest in businesses, then you've still got a system in which wealth inequity is naturally going to increase. And no amount of government regulation through taxation, for example, or welfare, is going to redistribute money fast enough in such a system because if it did, then there'd be no incentive for me to go into business in the first place. The incentive for people to go into business in that system is because they've got the possibility to become wealthier relative to others. The notion of a rising tide lifting all boats is bunkum. A rising tide just lifts all yachts. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of the system in which we live is if it has a for-profit narrative underneath it, it's going to continue inequity creation. What we need 
is a not-for-profit economic system in which profit, what's left over after your business expenses have been paid, goes back into the community, is regenerated rather than extracted. We live in an economics of extractivism. And luckily, we're heading towards a regenerative economics. How? Because capitalism has built into it its own death knell. Capitalism has set up a situation in which competition between businesses is the mechanism by which we find out who survives. And what we're starting to move towards is an economics where not-for-profit businesses that are increasingly entering the marketplace across different sectors are actually proving more competitive than their for-profit equivalents. So the credit unions, for example, in the US, they provide higher interest rates on loans, uh, sorry, higher interest rates on deposits, lower rates on loans consistently, <coughs> they have much lower rates in terms of foreclosures and the like, defaults on debt. They're much more conservative with their risk profile and they're more oriented towards local and sustainability. As a result, they've been taking market share in the banking sector, up a percent uh, in the years just after 2008 from the crisis. Now, just today, I was looking at insurance globally. Since 2011, I think it was from 2007 uh, to 2011, insurance companies that were not-for-profit, so mutual and cooperative insurance companies, where the members are the policyholders, and the policyholders are the owners of the company. Owners being a nominal word to describe ownership. No one owns it, really. They just have an investment, which is the equity in their own, uh, in their own policies. Not-for-profit insurance companies have increased by almost 4% their global position. That is a big amount. It's from 23 to 27%. Increasingly taking market share from the for-profit companies. And this is happening with health and leisure centres in the UK, where the top 10 health and leisure centres in the UK are all not-for-profit community interest companies. And the big for-profit companies that have the franchises, like your Fitness First and those sorts of companies, just can't compete. Why? There's tax advantages for not-for-profit income tax exemptions, they've got the capacity to engage volunteers. They're starting with a premise of working for community purpose and community benefit, not to maximise shareholder value. They work in more participatory ways with each other as enterprises. They don't engage with the typical old school, non-profit, ego battles that happen because they're in the marketplace and that brings a different kind of professionalism to their work that makes them look to collaborative alliances with other not-for-profit enterprises to compete against the for-profit businesses. They typically are engaging more and more younger people who are coming through with a drive when it comes to employment that puts passion and purpose first. Purpose-driven motivation, as, um, as Jeremy Rifkin and, and others have talked about. There's so many benefits that they sit on, whether it's donations and the ability to receive those in a tax-exempt form, through the donation of items, through the discounts on software and other infrastructural needs. You stack up all of these things and you start to see a picture growing where not-for-profit businesses, totally different from non-profit, charity-dependent organisations, which themselves have important roles to play. But these not-for-profit businesses are starting to increasingly take market share and show us that a not-for-profit economy is possible. That we are actually heading towards this. And if we want to be part of moving that forward, we can put our money into those organisations. We can support every not-for-profit business that exists around here and actually very rapidly provide them with the added advantage of having community support in terms of financial assistance. Now, how does this look when you actually talk about a macro economy? Because it's one thing to say that this is happening on the micro level in terms of the, the behavior of a firm and how things are competing. Well, the exciting thing is, having researched this for almost five years now, when we looked, with my colleague in Greece and I, when we looked at how would a macro economy work if every business were actually not-for-profit or we were heading towards every business being not-for-profit, what we found was amazing. 
we actually found that if every bank were not for profit, a credit union or a community bank or a mutual bank, for example, you actually start to see the debt within a system, first of all, reduce dramatically and then expand and contract with liquidity based on need rather than the push that comes from the for-profit banking system that is so um, aggressive, as we know in this country, the way that loans are pushed onto people. Instead, when you have a not-for-profit banking system, uh, as compared to a for-profit banking system that extracts wealth out to shareholders, right? you, you put your money into a bank for a, loan, or for a deposit, or you take out a loan, then the bank is, uh, with your deposit is able to make more loans to other people using the fractional reserve system. Within that model, there's money constantly being pulled out of the general commonwealth out to the private investors, who are usually a very small number of people. And so that's what fuels a narrative and the conditions for more and more debt and more and more growth in a system. And a growing population at the base helps to play forward that narrative. But in a not-for-profit banking system, the money actually goes back in. Any profit that the road credit union makes goes back either in the way of reduced costs for people who are members or through philanthropy. If you're a member of the Royal Credit Union here, you're able to actually vote on where you'd like some of the philanthropy that the credit union provides to go. You actually get to vote as a member on where that should go. So that's just a small taste, almost, of the exciting things that happen in an economy that I believe we're heading towards. And we're desperately needing it because we're in overshoot. We've got systems collapse almost at our door. And the models that get put forward, the proposals that get put forward, are generally so idealistic as to not be worth their time. Or they're so within the existing system that they won't break us out of the cycle in the way that we need. <clears throat> but what's exciting about the not-for-profit model is it builds on something that's already happening. It builds on the best of capitalism and continues the market economy. And I want to end with just a small story about really the way that uh, reinvestment and putting back in and, and thinking about limits can actually be a little different when we just shift our perspective to maybe a more of a not-for-profit ethic. So you may be familiar with Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22. He was at a party that was being put on, on an island uh, off the coast, uh, or the east coast of the U.S., and he was at this party with his friend who uh, was talking to him about the person who'd invited them, who was a very, very uh, big investment banker at the time. And Joseph's uh, friend came up to him and said, you must be really upset being here and just looking at all of this. And, uh, he said, why is that? And he said, well, because this gentleman, our friend here, earns more in a day than your book uh, will probably earn in, in its lifetime. And Joseph said, uh, doesn't bother me. His friend said, why is not? Why is that? And Joseph said, well, because I've got something that he'll never have. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to open up to questions and thoughts. We've just had a quick chance to touch in, and we've only got five minutes, but let's jump in. There was a question at the back there. Yes. Yeah, so my understanding of not-for-profits is they still have the ability to pay their executive directors whatever they want and their boards of directors. So what really is the difference between a for-profit that pays, you know, a million dollars to their exec and a not-for-profit that pays, you know, puts their profits into a salary? That is a great question. Um, a few quick points on that. First of all, the IRS does put limits on the capacity to pay salaries uh, of certain value. They have to be commensurate with industry uh, levels. And so, for example, that's why the NFL CEO gets $39 million. Um, and that's one that we could unpack with a little more time. But essentially, there's more limits on salaries within not-for-profit systems through the IRS than there actually are in for-profits. What you hear about are the outliers, the big, yeah. big salaries. So if you think about the average not-for-profit salary, it's not actually something that you can compare with the outliers that we hear about. The second thing is, and the reason that that often happens, is that rather than thinking about <coughs> the few that are gross when it comes to their salaries, you think about the millions of not-for-profits that exist. There's over a million in the U.S. Most of them are tied to local communities, and most of them have their board members are actually doing a good job 
of keeping an eye on, on salaries. They have often salary committees and the like. But the other thing is that the for-profit narrative often drives that competition. So if you take, why is it that so many hospitals these days, and two-thirds of the US's hospital system is not for profit, why is it that we have some revolting salaries uh, with the big CEOs within these not-for-profit organizations? It's because the for-profit market still exists enough that there's this <coughs> high level of competition and a narrative that talks <coughs> about what it means to attract talent. The bigger point, though, that underlies all of this that we don't see, and the invisible stuff is the stuff that really matters, is that if you take two companies, and one's a not-for-profit and one's a for-profit, and you're, you're outraged by the salary that this not-for-profit CEO is getting, the for-profit equivalent is going to at least be getting the same salary, right? What we don't see is what's, where's the money going in terms of shareholders? So if this one has a $1 million salary and this one has a $1 million salary, let's say that's possible, whatever company it is, we're not seeing the $20 million that's going out to the shareholders. That's really like the equivalent of saying that CEO gets a $21 million salary. We just don't see it. So I take it, it's a really good point. There's a lot that we put in the book that we're developing on how that when the dynamic changes towards not-for-profit, you actually see a flattening out of incomes, even within the not-for-profit sector itself. But the important thing to keep reminding ourselves is we live in an extractive economy where we don't see the exorbitance that actually sits underneath the system itself. Uh, yeah. um, I, in an earlier life, I was a professional investor, so <laughs> although I agree with you that there are a lot of segments of the economy where I think uh, nonprofits can thrive and, and perform very, very well, there's one segment I have some serious doubts about your model, yeah. and that is in high-risk entrepreneurship investments. And that's basically what I was in, because I was willing to take the risk. It was my money, but I could see a big payoff if it worked. Some did, some didn't. But overall, I came out very well. And I would not have invested that money in the not-for-profit sector. Great point. I think the exciting thing that's happening that's changing the game in terms of capital is that we're now starting to see uh, diversified risk-taking with collective uh, finance. So you now have, for example, crowdfunding. And what it's doing in terms of ventures that are being put out as not-for-profit, that are raising millions of dollars. Just yesterday, uh, I saw that a campaign launched in Australia for a new form of collecting honey from bee uh, hives. They put their goal at $70,000. Within 24 hours, they've raised $2.6 million. Now, that kind of investment for not-for-profit organizations didn't exist years ago. It just didn't. We've now got revenue-based financing, we've got community bonds, community and social impact bonds. We have increasing loans towards the not-for-profit sector from community development finance institutions. And we also have a very <coughs> inefficient state that should it be able to entrepreneurialize itself more, like as with the Ashland City and what it's doing with the fiber network and the profit that that brings in that subsidizes other activities. If the state can get more entrepreneurial, then you're sitting on a massive potential of money that could be put into more risky ventures. And that doesn't even start to take into account not-for-profit organizations that have for-profit subsidiaries underneath them, where they're legally separated and they can play with higher level risks, especially if they're a massive organization like the world's biggest not-for-profit organization, BRAC, out of Bangladesh, that has a $450 million turnover. So it's starting to... Or, or another example is IKEA, a not-for-profit organization that has the capacity to play in the risk area even more because it puts double, uh, sorry, Bosch, I'm thinking of Bosch, not Ikea yeah. at the moment. Ikea is a not-for-profit as well, but Bosch is a better example of a not-for-profit that puts double the industry budget into research and development. And they're able to do that, they say this on their website, we can do that because we're not paying our shareholders. We have more ability to move into riskier areas and play around because we're not beholden to shareholders. Could you speak to uh, what's called the circular economics of Ellen MacArthur? Because we just heard on the BBC last week, got pretty excited. The little I looked on the internet, these are for profit. The companies involved, but nevertheless, the whole, the ideas behind it. But Absolutely. So circular economy is where you actually look at closing the loop on systems and reducing waste. And the quickest example I can give to highlight where the advantages are and where there's some flaws in that model uh, is this follow. 
You want all companies within a not-for-profit system or globally to move towards more circular thinking, absolutely. More systems-based design that looks at feedback loops and systems. But you take Interface. Interface, the carpet company, is probably the best example in the US of a circular economy company. It looked at all its waste and its CEO said, I want to move towards zero waste without massive, and carpet is a very wasteful kind of business. So they reduced over the years water intake by 70%. They reduced their carbon output by, uh, I think it was 60%. They managed to actually use carpet, the offcuts, and refactor them in to their carpet design. All sorts of things, incredible. What else did they do? They tripled profits and they managed to patent more than ever. So what they were doing, on the one hand, was environmentally wonderful, but highlighted the limits of capitalism on the other, because they were making certain people wealthy, and in the process, creating the financial inequity within the system, that, he, that very inequity that drives the differentiation, the status envy, the consumption mindset, etc., that sits in the middle. So you can't have a for-profit economy and expect that we can get ourselves out of this mess. We need an economy of redistribution that actually brings us back to within limits and looks at flourishing from that perspective. Uh, Donnie has agreed if, if you're interested in staying and chatting with him while we're moving into the other room, he'll hang around for a while. And maybe if we keep him long enough, he'll come out to Bricktown for a beer with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to invite you again, if you would, to join us in the large room. We're going to be spending time talking about two, two, two projects, two project areas. One is renewable energy, and the other is um, what our government group is going to be doing. But if you would be so kind as to help us out by putting the chairs back, I'd appreciate it. Um, the, the racks are back there somewhere, and they just stack up there. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. You. One under here, and I think one at back. Thank you very much.